still remember it well. I had decided that I was ready to find somebody to spend the rest of my life with. So I did something I never thought I would do. I signed up for a website called Christian Mingle. And I remember I was able to operate under an alias. So basically, I I did what I sometimes refer to as trolling. I would look and see if there was someone that seemed interesting. And I'll never forget the day that I came across a very interesting person. So I sent an email. And nothing happened. Seven days had gone by and I'd kind of done an oh well. And I look and in my email box... It's a message from a person named Grace Van Heitzma. And she opened by letting me know that she had looked at my email a week before. Should have let me know something. (laughs) But was just now responding. And gave me all these lame excuses for why it took so long. But I wanted to know her bad enough that I kind of looked past all that. So I emailed back. And then she emailed back. And by about the third or fourth of those series of emails, we began to have connection. Began to realize that uh, maybe this might be interesting. And so we began to ask each other questions. It was pretty safe. We had not met each other. And we were able to do all this by email. And so I would ask her some very pointed questions and wait. And then I'd get a response back with answers to my questions and another set of questions for me. And that went on, and and I would get the response back, and I would realize I've got to think about this. I'd have to think about the answers she had given me, and then I had to think about how to put my best foot forward, tell the truth, but put the truth in words that were very encouraging about the questions she asked me so that hopefully I wasn't going to end any contact. I remember every time I sent an email off, I would think, well, this will either move us forward or we'll be done. And it gradually kept moving forward. And I would contemplate the things that she had said to me. I would think, you know, this is a problem with communication. What did she say? What did I think she said? What she thought she said? What I read into it that wasn't there? All of those dynamics were at work. And this went on. And uh, multiple emails where I began to think I knew her. And so I begin to think, how would I impress somebody? I contemplated, how would you really impress somebody when you meet them? Because I was going to meet her for the first time nearly three weeks later in person. So by this time, being a very long-term Fort Wayneian of over a decade, I knew that there was probably nothing that should impress a woman more than chocolate from DeBrands. And I spent a lot of money. (laughs) 
The brands has these boxes that look like a heart. And the box itself is made out of chocolate. And then they fill it with all those delightful chocolates that they make. So I thought, I'm going to meet her in person. I'll take her a gift from the brand. She'll be hooked. <laughs> Met her in person. Handed her the, the really nice DeBrand's bag that it was in. And literally, this was her response. Well, that's nice. <laughs> Didn't even open it. And I'm thinking, dear God, I want my money back. <laughs> but you see, we were still figuring each other out. Fortunately, she went back to work that afternoon and some of the women she worked with looked at the chocolate, were smart enough to figure that this was not something I picked up at Walgreens. And so they looked up the DeBrand's website, probably looked up how much I paid for it, and I think they told her, you better hang on to him as they proceeded to enjoy the chocolate. What I had not bothered to find out, and all the information I'd found out about Grace, I hadn't bothered to ask her, do you like chocolate? <laughs> but also, this is what happens with relationships, is that over time, what she found out was that maybe she had not been exposed to every kind of chocolate there was. And there are dark chocolates that are not milk chocolate. And she found out that hanging out with me was going to raise her to new levels of discrimination and taste. So we survived that first meeting, kept emailing. And literally, from October 14th to November 22nd, which was Thanksgiving that year, we had emailed each other back and forth, I believe a total of 70 times. And on Thanksgiving Day, I got an email with 40 blessings in her life. Not that my ego needed this, but I was very large in all of that. Felt good. And by that time, I think we were both pretty hooked. Crazy. March of 2013, just a short time later, we stood on this platform and pledged our lives to each other. We knew a lot about each other because we had asked a lot of questions and we had thought a lot about the answers to those questions. We get married, went to San Diego for our honeymoon, and then this was interesting. As much as we thought we knew... I think we both got to San Diego and all of a sudden the reality hit us as we're flying out there. You know, I'm going to be living with this person. <laughs> what do I really know? And that week was interesting because we found out some of the things that we had in common and some of the things we didn't. But we not only survived, it took us to deeper relationships. And then we came back home and we began to share life together, share money together. Up until I met Grace, I had always managed my finances. She's a CPA. Why would I manage my finances? So it was wonderful to just hand it to her and say, here, figure it out. Because the truth was, I would managed finances for probably by that time, 20 or 30 years, and had never balanced a checkbook. Well, not the way you're supposed to. <laughs> and yet, I never bounced a check. I always had enough money to cover whatever I did because I kind of knew where I was. But I was quickly learning that that's not how you do it. And so another wrinkle of what it was to get to know and I remember when I contemplated how to tell her that I now sometimes felt like a kid asking for allowance money when I wanted to do something. 
And it really wasn't what she was doing. It was how I was choosing to feel because now I was in a different place. So again, we processed. We spent time talking through. And I've got to tell you, it's been wonderful ever since. I have my own Amazon process person. Whatever I want, I simply send her an email with the link. And a few days later, or a few hours later, it magically appears on our front porch. It's hard to believe that October 14th will be 12 years since our world changed. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I'm sure glad that it worked out the way it did. Yeah, that's okay. (laughs) But in all of that... We're not where we are today because we just kind of flippantly got together. Because we are both processors and we both thoroughly analyze whatever we do. We came together because whatever we were talking about, whatever we ask each other, we would contemplate what does that mean. And really by the time there was an answer... It was a solid answer because it had had deep thought. We're in this series on Sabbath. We've talked about what it means to stop so you can experience Sabbath. Talked about a key aspect of Sabbath, which is rest. And then last week we talked about the delight that comes by observing Sabbath in our life. Today, we're going to look at that word, contemplate. And how does that apply to Sabbath? How do we actually have relationship with God that takes Him far beyond some kind of cosmic Santa Claus, a sinner's prayer that's fire insurance for eternity, but is based on a deep understanding and a quest to know God? God. And that comes through part of Sabbath that is contemplating and really digging out our relationship with God. Our theme for verse for this series is Hebrews 4, 9, and 10. We conclude there is a full and complete Sabbath rest waiting for believers to experience. As we enter into God's faith rest, life, we cease from our own works just as God celebrates His finished works and rests in them. This week's key verse for us learning how to contemplate is Isaiah 26, verse 3. This is from the Amplified Bible. You will keep in perfect and constant peace the one whose mind is steadfast, that is, committed and focused on you in both inclination and character. Because he trusts and takes refuge in you with hope and competent expectation. How do we really know who God is? How do we get him to reveal himself to us in a way that we understand, that we embrace And that we begin to understand how much He does know us as we get to know Him. And I believe it comes from spending quality time in the presence of God as you fully grasp the fact that His power is in you. Ephesians 1, Apostle Paul prays this great prayer, verse 18. I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of His calling, that is, the wealth of God's glorious inheritance that He finds in us, His holy ones. I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Then your lives will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through you, This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realm. It's a powerful truth. 
What I would encourage you to do if you're to experience the fullness of what Sabbath can be in your life, what it is to just get still, not just be so caught up in the busyness of our world and the distractions that are all over the place for us, that you really do come to know this. Could I challenge you to do an inventory of what you believe and know about God? Have you ever believed something and then later on found out it was wrong? You found out that what you had thought about something wasn't what it really was, but at the time you really believed it. So it's important for us to have faith, for us to believe God and to believe what we know is the truth of who God is. Four basic truths that we are built on as a church is Jesus is our Savior, Jesus is our baptizer in the Holy Spirit, Jesus is our healer, and Jesus is our soon coming King. I believe all of those, but I've also found that it's a quest for me to know all those, because all of those are part of the characteristics of who God is. And what I'm finding is this, what I understood about Jesus as a Savior, when I was three and a half years old and I prayed a prayer with my mother to ask Jesus into my heart, was a very small picture of what I today know about what it means to have Jesus as my Savior. Because not only have I learned more and more information than I knew at three and a half years old, but I've had a ton of life experience where I've watched how salvation plays out on my behalf. So today, when I say Jesus is my Savior, it's a far different picture than what I had as just a child with simple faith asking Jesus into my heart. So I would challenge you, what, what do you believe and what are the things you know about God? And, and then what is it that you look and realize, I still need to know? What is it that you can still learn about God that you don't have, yet have figured out? Grace and I have been together now nearly 12 years. There's things that I know about her. But I will tell you, some of the challenges we've had in the last few weeks and months, there's things I've learned about her that I didn't know before now. There's things I understand. There's deep appreciation that I already had, but, that, but that's been increased. Because I still want to know her more want that relationship to go far deeper than the pages of emails that we still have from when we first got to know each other. What is it that you still need to know about God? Where is He taking you on a journey? Have you ever noticed this? That sometimes the things that make you change and grow come not out of fun times, they come out of challenging times. Have there been times when you believe God, you're trusting God, and yet it seems like you're just getting slapped by life circumstances? And what's happening to you in your current reality seems so contradictory to what you believe about God. Have you ever experienced that? Are you experiencing that now? And, and yet... You're determined to know God, so how do you stay open when it looks like it's not working out so well? Because you, you have to recognize that what you're looking at right now is a frame in a movie that's beyond just one frame. And if you stop at the frame, you won't see the whole picture. But if you recognize God's at work, the last chapter isn't written yet, then you continue to grow. And I really challenge you to explore what it means to believe that we are in a continuum of the book of Acts. I was raised in a denomination, 
as very solid believers believe the Word of God, but they are a part of what is known, if you have an official name for it, as cessationist. And by that it means this, that after the New Testament, there is no longer a need for the things that happen in the New Testament of the working of the gifts of the Spirit, of the miraculous that took place in the book of Acts, because now we're established, the church is established, we have the written word of God, so we don't need. And the, and the scriptural basis used that's really the, the linchpin for that theology is 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul says, now we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away. And so the idea is that once we had the written word of God, we had the perfect, so we now knew everything. And I, I just think of that from a real practical standpoint. So if you know everything, explain to me why someone you know that was believing God for healing died. And then explain to me why someone else was prayed for and was healed. You know everything, right? You have all the answers. Do you understand the fallacy of that kind of thinking? The truth is, when that which is perfect has come, is Jesus is coming again. When he comes back, it's going to all be wrapped up. But meanwhile, we still know in part, and we still prophesy in part. There's things I have answers for, and there's things that I'm still learning. That's part of this contemplation. How do I go to a deeper place than where I'm already at, and how do I move forward? And, and I contend to you that the book of Acts was never intended as the recording of all the miraculous works of God, and then it's done. I believe that you and I are living in chapter 2024 of the book of Acts. It's a continuum. And that if it happened in the New Testament, it can still happen today. I am hungry for all that God has. There's literally nothing that God can't do. There's people in this room today that from a medical perspective, you should be dead. And you're not. Because God healed you. Do you understand why I can't be a cessationist? Because the only way I can validate your healing is if I believe that it can still happen today. That God still does that. It's still possible. Now how do we sort it out? Because here's the other problem. Is all the crazies in Jesus' name. And there's a lot of those out there too. People ask me what kind of church we are. And the two common names people use are Pentecostal and Charismatic, and I always kind of cringe a little bit because that's such a broad circus. It covers so many different groups of people. And the truth is, I like to basically say this. I'm a full gospel Christian. I believe that the complete gospel is where I live and the God of the full gospel is who I serve. And I want to know him more. So that's why I need to have times that I can withdraw and get to run, know who God is. And that's why Paul said, we need to get this full revelation of what God's calling is to us and what our inheritance is so that we can then embrace the total saturation of the Holy Spirit that's available to you. Listen, don't hassle with people over tongues. If you haven't experienced it, you're not a second-rate Christian. If you have, I don't know how to tell you this, but some of the meanest people I know speak in tongues. Because it's a gift, not a fruit. 
We put the benchmark in the wrong places. We need to understand that God wants us to know him. I'm not belittling tongues, but I'm not exalting it. What I'm exalting is the knowledge of God and the direction of his Holy Spirit within our lives and let him take us on the journey. What we need to do is be asking what could be more than what can't be. You know any negative people? You know, people that you walk out today and you say, man, the sun is shining today. Yeah, but it's going to be 90 degrees this afternoon. Oh, come on. It's looking cloudy today. Yeah, it's supposed to get rain and storms. There's probably going to be a tornado. You know anybody like that? They can find the dark side of any subject. I don't know about you, but when it comes to the things of God, I believe the glass is half full, not half empty. I want the fullness of God has. I don't want to be constantly trying to dissect everything God tells me. So if we begin to spend time contemplating God and His presence, what else do we need to do? We need to focus on wholesome thinking that resonates from God's perspective. I love Philippians 4.8. I'm reading it this time from the Passion. Keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God Praising Him always. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about what John Eldridge refers to as the three ways that we think. The shallows, which are just random thoughts that we have. The midlands, where is where we process the cares of life. And the depths that go to the very essence of who we are. And I believe any of those levels, we've got to determine, are we going to be people who live from the right thought processes. I'm not talking about not living in reality. But what I am talking about is living in a world where you live with a positive outlook. It's going to be 90 degrees this afternoon. Thank God we have air conditioning. What are the things that you think about? And what are the processes that you filter life through in your thoughts? What did Paul tell us? Ask this question. Is it authentic and real? Because it's important for it to be real. We don't live in Nana land. We, we don't live in something that is false. We do live with authenticity. And and one of the rich things to me is having relationship with people who live authentically for Jesus. And then we ask this question, is it honorable and admirable? Beautiful and respectful. What are the things that you talk about? Are they pure and holy? Do you show mercy and kindness? Someone were to describe how you talk as to how you think. Would everything I just said be in their point of reference? Do you allow yourself to be caught up in negativity? Do do you speak the things that are not the right way to think? We had a guy who helped us with administration at the large church in Florida I was a part of for years. And he was one of those people that he just had a way of finding the negative in whatever you talked to him about. And he, he, at that particular point, was helping manage budgets at the church. 
And so he would, he would just let you know, you don't have money. And I remember he had this white pad, you know, the, the white pad that you put on an easel. And, and he would lecture you when you went in to just have a conversation with him because, after all, he knew everything. And I never will forget, I walked in his office one day. I don't know who did this, but someone had taken his whiteboard that he used to lecture others and apparently they had been in for a budget meeting with him. And they basically said, I am poor, not broke. No, I'm broke, not poor, excuse me. I am broke, not poor. Because if you followed his mindset, it was never going to get any better. How do you look at it? How do you speak it? Because when we begin to contemplate God, we serve a positive God. We serve a God who creatively changed the world. And in the middle of what sin did, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can think or imagine. What is it that's negative in your life? i got good news for you. God's bigger than that, and he's got a way. So then how do we live powerfully from both knowing and thinking like God? Isaiah 41.10, Do not yield to fear, for I'm always near. Never turn your gaze from me, for I am your faithful God. I will infuse you with my strength and help you in every situation. I will hold you firmly with my victorious right hand. It starts by determining to let go of fear. Keep your eyes on Jesus. What's going on in your world? What's scaring you right now? Quit concentrating on that. Go back and start thinking about the authentic and real. God's power is greater than whatever negative is happening. What's honorable? It's pure and holy. What's, where's mercy going to come in? Begin to let those thoughts supersede the fear. And as you turn your eyes on Jesus, everything changes. In just a few moments, we're going to receive communion together. I'm going to ask those who are going to serve communion, if you begin to prepare, and as soon as you're ready, start serving. Ask everyone to hold the elements until we've all been served. We're going to receive it together. If you're not a member of Life Ridge, but you love Jesus, you're welcome to have communion with us this morning. How do you live in the present moment expecting that God's strength will be sufficient. What's in front of you this week that's overwhelming? God's strength is greater. Are you looking at what's overwhelming? Are you trusting in God's strength? Do you believe He's going to empower you? Do you believe He's going to enable you, that He's going to help you? We live a life that does not live in the valley of defeat. I walk through challenges, but I live from victory to victory to victory to victory. Why is that? Because I spend time contemplating who God is. As we think of this Sabbath concept, where are you making time in your week, in your day, to really get to know God? What is it that you need answers to? I'm going to tell you something that is amazing in the world you and I live with technology. Let's say you want to know about love. Just go to Dr. Google and just enter Bible verses about love. And then just 
hit the button. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be amazed at the number of scriptures that will now be available to you on the subject of love. What does God say about healing? I like to always ask what are the scripture verses so I don't get some crackpot out there who said their version of what God's saying. I want to know what the Word of God says. And then when I read it, I contemplate it. Same way when Grace would send me those emails and I would read what she said, before I responded back to her, I would go back and read them several times to make sure I fully grasped what she was saying, that I understood. And if I didn't understand, you know what I did? I went back and asked her to clarify for me what she had said. And trust me, she did the same thing to me. What do you need to know from God? Read what His Word says and then contemplate it. A gift that has been given to us is the Uversion Bible. I will tell you this, very rarely do I bring you scriptures, and if you've been here any length of time, you know I do a lot of scripture in my messages. I very rarely use a scripture that I haven't filtered through several versions with you version of how that version states it. So that by the time I'm done, I really feel like I have a good grasp of what is being said in that verse. And then I take some more time and just say, God, show me. Is there something I'm not seeing? Is there something more I need to see? Help me to understand what you're saying to me. And it's amazing what God does when we do that. It's amazing how God begins to open up. And it's that contemplation, that sense of taking the time and effort to really get to know God and to understand what His Word says to us with such clarity. And there's wonderful translations. And it's important to understand those. And I have a lot of people who struggle with, they tell me they struggle with all the different translations. And I know, I know, some, of, some folks say, you want to read the King James Version that Jesus read, right? How do I break this to you gently? King James Version wasn't around in New Testament times. And it was sanctioned by one of the most ungodly kings that ever lived. And yet he sanctioned it, and, and it's been a huge blessing to the church. It's a little easier for me to read the New King James that have been put into more today's English and less these and thous in it. But then I found that sometimes the New Living Translation is just nice to read. One that I'm enjoying a lot is the Passion. Now, if you go read, the guy who did the Passion Translation appears to have a pretty big ego and, and makes some pretty tall claims about how he got where he got. You know, I'm not here, I'm not judging King James, I'm not going to judge him either. Because what the judge is, is what do the Scriptures actually say? And I've read the Passion enough with other translations that it's pretty spot on in everything I've seen that it says. And if you disagree with that, that's okay. Whatever things are lovely, think on those things. I'm not going to get all bent out of shape if you disagree with me. If I really want to know what something says, I get the Amplified. Because the Amplified is probably the closest you could come to getting original Greek and Hebrew without actually doing it. So that if I want to know something, I, I like the Amplified because it, it's like, have you ever met somebody that when they tell you something, it takes them 12 sentences to say two words? Amplified's Bible like that. God, the one and only creator of the universe, the Father of Jesus, the Son, and the, the Holy Spirit joined together. And this God that we have come to love and know is a mighty God instead of just saying God. But boy, it explains some things sometimes. It's wonderful. Get to know God. Contemplate the things of God. That's a part of Sabbath. You have to take time for that to happen. Probably one of the most profound things we do 
is receive communion. And I want you to do this. We're going to receive it without a lot of time this morning. But I would ask you this week to just contemplate his body was broken for me. I think of times where I received healing. Because his body was broken for me. You have whatever it is for you. His blood was shed. I've done a few things I'm not proud of. There's a few decisions I've made that I'd love to change. There's actions I've taken, sometimes reactions, that I wish I had back. But the blood of Jesus covers it all. You start feeling bad about what you've done, who you feel like you are, begin to contemplate the blood of Jesus and what the blood of Jesus is to you and then watch and see what God does so we're going to receive these elements together now but I would encourage you this week to take some time and contemplate go to Dr. Google and type in scripture about the body and blood of Jesus and then start reading. If you don't have the Version Bible on your smart device, get it. If you don't know how because you're old to get it, reach out to your eight-year-old grandkid and they'll download it for you and show you how to use it. But just take time this week to contemplate the body and blood of Jesus. Shall we eat the bread? Drink the cup. Thank you, Jesus, for life. Thank you for celebrating life. Thank you for who you are, what you've done, what you're still doing. Help us to be the people you've called us to be. And we give you glory and we give you honor. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hadn't this been an incredible morning of celebration? Would you rejoice one more time for 14 people who were baptized in water this morning? And that awesome.